Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, latest update in the Kirby seminar series. Today we have a presentation from the winner of the uh, Graduate Student Prize, which we award annually for the best paper uh, as part of a PhD thesis. Uh, so before we start, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we all join uh, today's seminar and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. I myself join today from the lands of the Darwal people uh, and acknowledge that the lands were never ceded. For today's seminar, uh, Heather will present and then there will be the opportunity to ask questions. To do so, please go to the Q&A icon uh, at the top of your screen, click on that and uh, write in your questions. Uh, and we will uh, go through those at the end of Heather's presentation. So as I said, today's seminar is presented by this year's winner of the student, the Graduate Student Prize at the Kirby, and that's awarded for the best paper that's published as part of a PhD project. And this year's winner is Heather Valario, who won the prize for her paper, Progress Towards Elimination of Hepatitis C Infection Among People Who Inject Drugs in Australia, the Ethos Engage study. And this was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases. Heather studied uh, health sciences and public health in Boston at Boston University and then completed a Masters of Public Health at the University of Glasgow. She joined uh, us here at the Kirby in 2018 and started a PhD with the Viral Hepatitis Clinical Research Program where, and her principal area of study is achieving hepatitis C elimination and improving the health and well-being of people who inject drugs. Over to you, Heather. Uh, thanks very much, Tony. Um, I would first like to acknowledge that I am on Gadigal land and I pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be viewing the presentation today. I'd also like to say a big thank you to the committee who chose this work as the winner of this year's student prize. Um, I've said before that the world is a very different place to when I started my PhD in March 2018. And it's really reassuring to know that the fight to eliminate hepatitis C among people who inject drugs remains a priority um, in public health and at the Kirby. Uh, as Tony said, today I'll be presenting a chapter of my PhD to you today. And that is entitled Progress Towards Elimination of Hepatitis C Infection Among People Who Inject Drugs in Australia. And it uses data from the Ethos Engage study. And this work was published in uh, Clinical Infectious Diseases uh, and is available online should you be so inclined to go and give it a read after uh, the presentation. And before jumping in, I would like to acknowledge a few key groups of people who are integral in ethos. Uh, first of all, the results that I'm presenting this afternoon would not be possible without the contribution of each participant who was recruited into ethos engage. Participation was compensated with a voucher, but it also was done so on a voluntary basis. So I sincerely thank the community of people who inject drugs and people who are infected with hepatitis C for their contribution to this work and to the knowledge of hepatitis C as a whole. Uh, I consider myself very lucky to be a part of Ethos Engage. Uh, through this project, I've been able to put faces and names and stories behind all the numbers and figures that I'll present. I would also like to uh, pay special gratitude to all the peer workers uh, that we had in the study from NUA, YouthLink CAMS, Harm Reduction WA and Hepatitis South Australia who have contributed invaluably to this work. Uh, the study and what I will present today is the result of a massive collaborative team effort. So I would also like to acknowledge everybody named on this slide. Uh, particularly my supervisors, uh, Greg, Jason and Mariam and to this amazing crew who have been instrumental in the coordination and operation of Ethos, David, Indica, Shane, and Maria. 
All right, so a little high level background. Um, it is currently estimated that there are 58 million people infected with hepatitis C worldwide, about 118,000 of which are in Australia. And within the last decade, there's been this incredible evolution in the therapies used to treat hepatitis C, uh, what many consider one of the biggest mo uh, watershed moments in modern medicine, probably the biggest moment before the development of COVID vaccines. Uh, the therapies to treat hepatitis C evolved from often intolerable and um, low effectiveness interferon injections to direct acting antiviral therapy that is for the most part side effect free and over 90% effective. Because of this amazing transformation in the treatment landscape, the World Health Organization set targets to eliminate hepatitis C as a public health threat by 2030. And this elimination is defined by a 90% reduction in incidence and a 65% reduction in hepatitis C mortality. And in the absence of a vaccine to prevent um, hepatitis C infection, the World Health Organization set some service level targets to realize elimination, including ensuring that 80% of people who are diagnosed initiate treatment. And there was early evidence that demonstrated the feasibility of hepatitis C elimination through a mechanism known as treatment as prevention. Uh, this involved prioritizing people who inject drugs for treatment as they are the population who's at most risk of hepatitis C acquisition and transmission. Uh, however, direct acting antiviral therapy or DAA therapy was initially very expensive and often bound in some red tape and it was therefore prioritized to those at most risk of death, so those with severe liver disease, or the reimbursements for this therapy were restricted based on patient and provider characteristics. And unlike the settings that had to restrict therapies, since March 2016, Australia has had broad, unrestricted access to DAA therapy for all infected adults, and that's irrespective of liver disease status or concurrent drug and alcohol use and previous treatment. And I wasn't in Australia at this time. Um, in fact, I was working in a country that was prioritizing DAA treatment to those with severe liver disease. And at this time, we all in this team uh, thought Australia looked something like this because from March 2016, the elimination of hepatitis C in Australia was feasible. Uh, there was an initial surge of people initiating hepatitis C therapy in March 2016. And this has remained high, but has since tapered off. And an important question uh, for us health researchers to know is um, among people who inject drugs, that is the population who's at the biggest risk of infection and transmission, who has received treatment, who is currently infect with, infected with hepatitis C, and who are the populations who need targeted and enhanced support to initiate hepatitis C care and facilitate our elimination efforts. So that brings us to the aims of this paper. Uh, the aims were to gauge the progress toward eliminating hepatitis C among people who inject drugs. And we did this by uh, evaluating the factors associated with the receipt of hepatitis C therapy and the factors associated with current hepatitis C infection. And to answer these questions, we're using data that was gathered from the Ethos Engage study. Uh, Ethos Engage is an observational cohort study that collects baseline data on hepatitis C treatment uptake and current prevalence. We recruit participants from opioid agonist treatment or OAT clinics, drug and alcohol treatment centers, and needle and syringe provision sites throughout four Australian states. To be included in Ethos, you have to be at least 18 years old, you have to be able to provide written informed consent, and you have to have a history of injecting drugs. That's either a recent history as defined by injecting in the previous six months or ever injecting drugs in your lifetime and currently receiving opioid agonist treatment. We did exclude people who were pregnant from participating. Our campaign days ran from May 2018 to September 2019 and we recruited across 25 sites. Each campaign ran uh, between two to four days and during which we engaged between 10 to 120 participants per site. Uh, Ethos Engage campaign days comprise multiple stages. Uh, we provide a, each service with a 
range of snacks and refreshments in the waiting area. And this is where a peer worker from one of the organizations I mentioned at the beginning engages with clients to encourage them to participate. If clients are willing to take part, we obtain informed consent, and then all participants undergo point of care testing to test for active hepatitis C infection or test for hepatitis C RNA. Uh, participants then go on to receive a liver health assessment, and that's done by FibroScan. And then they go and have a brief clinical consultation with uh, staff from the site. Uh, each participant then goes on to complete a robust questionnaire that asks uh, questions regarding demographics, drug use history, and experience with hepatitis C, including testing and treatment. And this map gives you an idea of the spread of our campaign sites. Uh, most of them were located within New South Wales, but we did also travel up to Queensland and over to South Australia and Western Australia. And from these sites, between May 2018 and September 2019, we enrolled a total of 1,468 participants. And after making some necessary exclusions, we were left with 1,443 participants with sufficient data for analysis. Uh, and the mean age of these participants was 44, 65% were male, 11% homeless, just under a quarter were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, 68% uh, had ever been incarcerated, and just under three quarters were uh, currently receiving OAT. And we did enroll a high proportion of people who uh, recently injected drugs, with 76% reporting injecting in the last six months, 64% reporting injecting in the last month, and 30% daily or more. And we were really encouraged to see that 80% of participants reported a lifetime history of hepatitis C testing. So of those 1,443 participants with sufficient data, 55% or 788 had evidence of active hepatitis C either past or currently. And that is the population of people who would have been eligible to ever receive hepatitis C treatment. And of those, 66% uh, reported on the survey that they had received hepatitis C treatment at some time in the past, with the majority of those um, initiating treatment after March 2016. So when we stratified this by our behavioral um, and demographic subgroups of interest, we see that treatment uptake remained pretty high across the board and largely above 50%. We do notice um, some gaps uh, between people who are homeless and people who aren't, and uh, between people who were never uh, receiving OAT and those who are currently receiving OAT. And we ran a logistic regression model to test for the factors that were associated with um, receipt of hepatitis C therapy. And when we did, we saw that age was associated. So those who were older than the median age, more likely to have received treatment than those who were younger. Uh, women were less likely than men to have reported receiving treatment. People who were homeless uh, were less likely to have reported receiving treatment than those who were housed. People who are uh, currently receiving OAT were more likely to have reported receiving treatment than those who had never received OAT. And people who had reported injecting drugs daily or more less likely to have reported receiving treatment than those who had reported um, injecting more than a year ago. So current hepatitis C infection in ethos was determined by the Cephe gene expert. And using this platform, we were able to get valid results for over 95% of our participants. Of those with valid hepatitis C RNA results, 55% had evidence of ever having active hepatitis C infection. 32% of the overall group with valid results had evidence of treatment-induced clearance. So those are the people who um, said, yes, I have ever received treatment and also tested negative on the campaign day. And 24% of the overall group with uh, valid test had evidence of active current hepatitis C infection. And again, when we delineated this by our behavioral and demographic subgroups of interest, uh, when we look across uh, the 
slide here at the dark blue bar and look to see um, how many or what the proportion of active infection was across these groups, we do see that it was relatively low and stable across each uh, subpopulation. Of course, we notice um, some differences between people who are homeless and people who aren't, and a difference in incarceration history with those who have never been incarcerated uh, with a lower prevalence of hepatitis C infection than those who have a history of incarceration, either more than a year ago or within the last year. And we ran a similar logistic regression model here to adjust for confounding and look for factors that were associated with hepatitis C um, infection. And when we did, we see that those who were homeless were more likely to have current hepatitis C infection on the campaign day than people who were housed. People with an incarceration history, so either more than a year ago or within the last year, more likely to have current hepatitis C infection. And people who injected daily or more, more likely to have current hepatitis C infection than those who had injected more than a year ago. So it is clear from these results that there are a few key groups that require enhanced support to facilitate elimination. And I won't go into detail about them all, but I will discuss a few of them today. Uh, one of the main findings of this work was that women were less likely than men to have reported receiving hepatitis C treatment. And this highlights the importance of engaging women with hepatitis C treatment and care. Uh, women uh, do report, uh, or research has demonstrated that women report uh, increased stigma, marginalization, and vulnerability, and this might be at play hindering treatment uptake in this group. Um, Allison Marshall from our group is conducting a series of interviews with women who inject drugs um, who have not yet received hepatitis C treatment to further understand how we can provide quality and accessible health care to this group. Um, so that will be really interesting to sort of tease out that finding. Uh, also, as part of the supplementary analyses for this paper, uh, we stratified treatment uptake by gender. And interestingly, women over 45, so over the median age, had a comparable treatment uptake to men over 45. But the difference was really seen uh, between men and women under 45, with women under 45 very much less likely to have received treatment. And we hypothesize that this might be due to the multiple roles that young women take on in life, particularly the new role as a mother. And this hypothesis will be further investigated um, through those qualitative interviews and also through a data linkage study that assesses the cascade of hepatitis C care among or along the pregnancy continuum. Another key message from this work was that people who are homeless were less likely to have reported receiving hepatitis C treatment and more likely to have current hepatitis C infection. Uh, people who are homeless face intersecting and overlapping vulnerabilities between accessing food, shelter, and often don't have the proper identification for medical appointments or obtaining prescriptions. Uh, ideally, the um, interventions to enhance hepatitis C care among people who are homeless would be holistic in addressing all of those needs. Uh, furthermore, I think it's unfair to put all of the expectation on somebody who's combating so much uh, to prioritize hepatitis C among every other pressing issue in their life, especially when they're that large. Uh, the expectation really is on us as healthcare professionals to bring care to people who need it. Uh, I think an interesting next step forward would be to incorporate a peer-led mobile outreach unit, which would basically be like an ethos on wheels, uh, to meet people where they're at um, to engage them with hepatitis C care. Uh, people who injected drugs daily or more and people who have ever been incarcerated were more likely to have current hepatitis C infection. Uh, both of these results really highlight the importance of harm reduction, which is cornerstone in the pursuit of hepatitis C elimination. Uh, we've seen from previous Kirby studies that prisons can be used as a setting to enhance hepatitis C care through point of care testing and treatment initiation and monitoring whilst incarcerated. Uh, in saying this, of course, it's important to ensure that people um, receive informed consent before starting treatment in a custodial setting. 
Uh, furthermore, the incorporation of uh, peer based organizations within a harm reduction setting has the potential to facilitate appropriate psychosocial support um, and enhance healthcare related communication between people who inject drugs and healthcare professionals. And this is particularly important in reaching those individuals who injected drugs more than daily. So these results have been used to inform two iterations of the national report that evaluates Australia's progress towards hepatitis C elimination and in the inaugural New South Wales Hepatitis C Elimination Monitoring and Evaluation Report. These results were also used in an invited editorial in uh, Liver International that compares hepatitis C treatment in Ethos Engage to a similar cohort of people who inject drugs in Baltimore in the United States. And these results have been instrumental in the development of a national Australian hepatitis C point of care testing program, which aims to simplify and centralize hepatitis C testing and treatment by incorporating point of care testing platforms in a network of 65 drug treatment clinics in all states and territories nationally. Of course, um, ethos is not without its limitations. Um, for example, the majority of participants were recruited through an opioid agonist treatment setting, and this has potentially introduced some sampling bias into our cohort as we have potentially oversampled an engaged population of people who inject drugs. However, as we saw on the characteristics slide before, it is encouraging that we have enrolled a high proportion of high risk um, people. Uh, for example, those who reported uh, daily or more injecting. Uh, another limitation is that we're not able to account for mental health comorbidities or inpatient hospitalization, both of which are factors that have been shown to be associated with lower treatment uptake. Uh, however, the majority of participants that we recruited from New South Wales did consent to a subsequent data linkage study where their ethos data will be linked to longitudinal administrative data sets. So assessing those associations will be feasible in the future. So that's actually um, all for the published paper, but I thought I would briefly discuss what has been happening with ethos since this publication. Uh, we closed recruitment for ethos engage in September 2019. And then we recommenced with a second wave of recruitment in November of 2019. Uh, we revisited all the sites in light blue on this map 12 to 36 months after our initial visit. Uh, and the second wave of recruitment was just completed in June 2021 after taking a small COVID related recruitment hiatus. And um, as I said before, 1,443 participants were recruited in wave one between May 2018 and September 2019, and 1,211 were recruited in wave two um, and from November 2019 to June 2021. And the characteristics of these two cohorts were very similar in both recruitment waves. And I just thought it would be interesting to show some brief results from wave two. Uh, among those who were recruited in wave one, we saw earlier that 66% of the treatment eligible population had ever reported receiving treatment. And we're really encouraged to see that in wave two of those who were ever treatment eligible, 78% had ever reported receiving treatment. And this figure represents um, current hepatitis C infection status, where the darker color is current hepatitis C infection. And we saw before that in wave one, 24% of the overall cohort tested positive for hepatitis C RNA on the day. So we're infected, currently infected with active hepatitis C infection. And of those that were tested in wave two, we were encouraged to see that this um, prevalence went down to 15%. So in conclusion, uh, these results are a testament to the successes of the public health approach to um, hepatitis C therapy in Australia and how this policy has vastly improved the provision of hepatitis C care for people who inject drugs. We've shown that unrestricted access to DA therapy has produced high treatment uptake and low hepatitis C prevalence among people who inject drugs, and that's largely true across marginalized populations. Uh, however, to maintain our momentum towards hepatitis C elimination and achieve our elimination targets, 
people with significantly higher active infections, so those who have been incarcerated, people who are homeless, or people who frequently inject, and those um, who were significantly less likely to initiate hepatitis C therapy, so those who are younger, female, homeless, uh, never on OAT, and again, frequent pe people who frequently inject, do require additional support to encourage engagement with hepatitis C care. There are some further things to consider with this cohort and um, future considerations uh, to look into. Uh, we do need to further understand the impact that COVID-19 will have on hepatitis C testing and treatment and its knock-on effects on our overall hepatitis C elimination efforts. And we in Ethos and um, in VHCRP are very passionate about improving the health and well-being of people who inject drugs, and we do recognize that this extend, ex expands uh, beyond hepatitis C and uh, may, very importantly into overdose prevention. So hopefully these uh, will be made a little bit more clear with Ethos Wave 3, which Jason has just secured funding for. Uh, Ethos Wave 3 has an exciting protocol amendment which will facilitate a test and treat model of care to incorporate same day treatment initiation for all those who test positive on campaign days. And we will also be incorporating a peer led naloxone training station for all participants to be trained in opioid overdose reversal. So Ethos has certainly brought me to a lot of beautiful places and it's facilitated a lot of beautiful conversations with people from all walks of life that I probably wouldn't have ever gotten to meet otherwise. Uh, again, thank you uh, to all the participants and the peer workers and those who contributed to the study. And thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thanks, Heather, for that terrific, uh, very clear uh, presentation uh, and a great walkthrough of the uh, the work that has been done and is being done in Ethos. I think it was a really excellent uh, presentation, very worthy of um, uh, a Kirby Student Prize winner. So congratulations on that great presentation. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'd encourage people to uh, ask Heather questions uh, and enter those into the Q&A question. And while we're waiting for people to do that, um, what I'd like to ask you, Heather, is, you know, so you've, you know, you've had this disseminated approach to recruiting these patients. Taking that into account, what what you've experienced uh, and the feasibility of doing this work in this disseminated fashion, uh, and given the sort of gaps that you uh, pointed out uh, in the possible population, if you had uh, unlimited uh, supply, balancing fee of of resources, balancing sort of the feasibility against uh, outcome, what what would be your sort of perfect complementary sites to the ones that you've already recruited through to to make sure that you're getting at at these uh, vulnerable populations? Uh, yeah. So, like I said before, I think really the approach going forward or a really interesting approach to take forward would be going to people where they are, uh, either in a harm reduction setting or in a mobile unit to go out and um, engage people and kind of lessen the expectation for them to show up in front of you in a clinic. Uh, I saw a really interesting presentation at the last um, INSU conference, which is a very big conference in our group, uh, from a Norwegian group that did this um, mobile unit uh, with peers that led the um, initiation. So they drove the bus and they had people in the back. So it's just a really amazing way to go out there and be relatable and get people in and put people at ease um, for getting treatment. And, and what sort of areas, sort of geographic or socioeconomic, that would you target with those um, mobile units? Uh, well, for our results now, I, I think it, it's it's hard to extrapolate um, beyond the geographic areas that we uh, saw. 
we did do a little bit of analysis to look to see whether uh, metropolitan versus rural regional um, had a bit of difference in treatment uptake. And I think there was a little bit. Um, it would be good to go out into more regional and rural areas because they're a little bit under tested as referenced by our map and to see what the prevalence is out there. And, and I'll just I'll just follow up on that a little further. And how do you advertise this or how do you make it known in these these difficult to uh, approach communities that this is actually happening? What what approaches do you take to to make sure people are informed? With, yeah, with for ethos, uh, we do have um, posters that we send to each site to put up in their harm reduction units and their uh, dosing clinics at their opioid um, agonist treatment sites. Um, we also have little cards that we put in with uh, the distribution of needles and syringes um, so that if people go in to pick up some things, they don't realize what's on the wall around them. They will see it when they go home and uh, open up their their kit. Uh, and we also encourage um, site staff to send out some messages via text to people that they know should come in and speak to us and get the point of care test for hepatitis C. OK, so I'll take a question from uh, the, the chat. Um, so I know you've already addressed this, but I was hoping you might expand on the lower proportions of women who have received treatment. This seems to be contrary to studies of other diseases looking at health seeking behavior by gender. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I've seen uh, studies as well that say, you know, women are more likely to show up to a GP or show up to a hospital. But I think the difference there is within, um, you know, that's not looking within a population of women or female identifying people who inject drugs. Um, it's been shown in literature for drug user health that women are often uh, they uh, experience uh, far more stigma, marginalization and vulnerability than men. And this does hinder people from going forward and identifying as somebody who might use drugs uh, to healthcare professionals uh, because of that fear of being discriminated against. Uh, so it's a little bit different there with other studies. Uh, and one from the ever reliable Philip Keane. Uh, congratulations, Heather, on the prize and the present and this presentation. Great point about reducing the burden on marginalized people through e.g. mobile units. Are there examples of how people have overcome this uh, e.g. the lack of ID, etc. Have overcome the lack of ID, etc. I'm a little unclear what uh ID, infectious disease, what, what's uh, that? I guess, I, I, I think it might be identification, perhaps. Oh, right. Um, yeah, well, I know that Kirkton Road Centre and other low threshold um, centres do a lot of great um, outreach to people um, who are homeless or people who inject drugs uh, and don't require identification for hepatitis C testing. And it's all done sort of on an anonymous basis. I'm not entirely sure what the feasibility of that is, um, rolling it out sort of onto a national level, um, but it's certainly something that would be ideal in, in um, engaging these groups. And then maybe to take you back to uh, close to your last slide and and the, what, what do you think, uh, I know it's not part of this study, but you know, given that we've all been dealing with uh, the the COVID pandemic, what what do you think the effect of the COVID pandemic has been on on this population and their access to both uh, testing and treatment? Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of this care that's been provided has been done so opportunistically through these centers like opioid agonist treatment centers where there's been a lot of foot traffic. You have a lot of familiarity with the site staff there. You build up sort of a uh, repertoire of trust and you're able to, you know, say yes to a hepatitis C test or initiating treatment. Uh, with COVID, of course, um, foot traffic in these clinics has had to greatly reduce um, and people have been 
moved off of daily dosing and onto long lasting opioid agonist treatment uh, like injectable uh, depo buprenorphine. Uh, I don't know if um, that's going to have a large impact on the amount of people who were tested or treated. I think um, only time will tell. There's been some papers, some modeling papers that have been published um, on sort of the suspected impacts of uh, physical distancing and COVID-19 on hepatitis C elimination efforts, which were uh, they were very interesting. Uh, it did show that there would be a bit of a delay. Um, those were all based off of 2020, so I think they would definitely have to be updated for 2021 and the um, inclusion, of course, now of vaccines. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much, Heather, for both uh, an excellent presentation and really thoughtful and excellent, well-constructed answers to those questions. So um, I think uh, we should all applaud you for your, your efforts. Uh, and unfortunately, we can only do that uh, virtually. Uh, and with that, I think we should uh, close the session. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to everyone.